Do 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 do. And we are live! Hello, one and all, and welcome to another session of Building Worlds. I am Joshua McGregor, and I am here doing an open writing session where I'm doing some world building. Uh, we are back for our second time to the world of Unan, and I am really jazzed uh, to come back. Last time, we sort of set up uh, what different races would be here, which ended up being all of them, uh, <laughs> including some some new ones, which I, I have uh, since then fleshed out a little bit. And looking at bum, 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 a world map. Uh, this is an enormous world. Each of these is its own separate continent that we've only begun to scratch the surface on. And so what I was hoping to do uh, this time around would be look a little bit more at sort of the founding mythology and the dividing nature of uh, the Esmeran Empire and the Esmeran gods that are still around. Is that light dark enough? There we go. Um, the dividing nature of the Esmeran gods on this planet, specifically a planet that was so central to so much history for the Esmeran gods, uh, and then I wanted to keep populating the world. I want, I really, uh, was interested in, this is an updated timeline here, um, like, let's make more nations, tribes, and clans, let's make as many sovereign, uh, things as we can, let's make some more cities, um, <coughs> and, uh, we can make some more characters as well. Uh, there are certain areas of Unan that I am very interested in fleshing out a little bit more, uh, including Ipacriel, because Ipacriel is a city that uh, that is incredibly important. Let's uh, zoom in there so you can see. This is, a, this is a city that was very, very important to the Ismeran gods, and is therefore an important city now. Um, <laughs> and then, oh, hello in chat! Hello, Alberta! Hello, little zoo here! Yes, yes, indeed! So, uh, on the continent of Ionovos, we've got uh, a little bit more to explore there, even though that is the most populated area that we've got. And then I would love to look at uh, Chakranagol. I would love to uh, and begin to populate various other areas of, uh, of our map and, uh, and, and, and put all kinds of people here. Because I, I want this to be, to be quite fleshed out. The other thing I would like to do is figure out where the Cagrians would live, uh, because Cagrians were uh, a race that we established sort of in the last stream. We had um, people asking for a goat folk homebrew race, and that sounded far too cool and fun not to make. So actually, let's start by introducing the Cagrian. I've just got Welsh as like a note. Um, but the, uh, the Cagrian, the mountains and plains of many worlds have given rise to the Cagrian, goat-like humanoids who have proven to be amongst the most resilient species yet encountered. Most Cagrian societies are peaceful and pastoral, though Cagrians can rise to tremendous feats of martial prowess and fortitude. Fortitude. They are underestimated at one's peril. Cagrians also integrate well with other races and societies and are welcomed more often than not. So these are, these are goat folk. They have a, an ability score increase uh, by one to their strength, con, and intelligence. So a bit more of a spread. Hello, Crentacle! Welcome, welcome! We're just going over the Cagrian race from last time, and then we we're going to start uh, doing some more populating of the world of Unan. I had a lot of uh, interesting ideas, so we would just jump right in there. Uh, languages. You can speak and write common in one of the languages that your DM uh, agree is pr appropriate for the character. Um, we actually created a language for the Kagrian race, so we are calling this Kagrish. So that is a new language that exists out there for characters to learn, is Kagrish. Um, also, you know, while we're talking about this, I also did the Krokrasni from Rayara, which, you know, we would get back to Rayara at some point and do a little bit more work, but... Uh, they have a their own language as well called Korokras. Um, 
which I'm pretty sure would just mean, like, language of the crustacean people. Uh, <laughs> uh, they, Cagrians are humanoids. They have a lifespan of around 150 years, so live around, a, you know, uh, uh, around half, uh, you know, another 50% as long as humans. Size, that's not bolded for no reason. Medium. Walking speed's 35 feet. Wanted to give them an extra 5 feet of movement because goats. Uh, because you got hooves is for, for feet. Um, and then we've got three abilities. We've got, or four abilities. We've got the belligerent hardiness. You have advantage on constitution saving throws and advantage on saving throws against becoming poisoned or diseased. Uh, just to uh, sort of represent the, the goat's ability, the seeming ability to be, to eat anything. I know they don't actually eat anything, but that's kind of a fun idea that they can sort of like survive in any conditions. The bewildering ascent, you have a climbing speed equal to your walking speed and the ability to move up, down, and across vertical surfaces. So part of the text of a spider climb spell in essence is attached to, whoop, uh, is attached to the Cagrian because mountain goats are so crazy the way they go up mountains. Uh, it's fun. Ram, uh, you can Use your head and horns to make unarmed strikes. If you hit with them, you deal bludgeoning damage equal to 1d4 plus your strength modifier. Makes sense. And then hammering horns. I made this a little bit stronger than uh, than other equivalent ones from, from other races. Because I want to give people cool things. And I would rather have a race be more powerful than less powerful. Hammering Horns. Immediately after you hit a creature with a melee attack as part of the attack action on your turn, you can use a bonus action to attempt to shove that creature with your horns. The target must be within 5 feet of you, and no more than one size larger than you, unless it succeeds on a strength saving throw against DC equal to 8 plus your proficiency bonus plus your strength modifier, you push it up to 10 feet away from you. If you move at least 30 feet straight toward the target prior to the attack, so if you so if you're just hitting somebody, you just go boom, and then you can just hit them, headbutt them, and send them going backwards. Otherwise, you can run up to them as fast as you can, and uh, and then attack and then headbutt. Uh, the target takes bludgeoning damage equal to 1d4 plus your strength modifier, and is pushed. So it counts sort of as the ram attack uh, damage and is pushed up to 15 away on a failed save. On a successful save, the target takes half as much damage and is pushed up to 5 feet instead. So if you do 30 feet of running straight towards the target, then you're guaranteed to get 5 foot of push. Which is strong, I know, but uh, feels cool. Feels cool. And so that's what I wanted to do. Uh... Yes, Kieran, hello in the chat. Uh, you want a little bit of an update on uh, on Unan. Absolutely. Let's uh, let's do a little recap of Unan. Um, this is a metropolitan world. This world was the center of trade for the Asmeran Empire because the Asmerans, uh, who, who owned many planets uh, in the history of this world, uh, 700 years ago, we get the end of the Ismeran, the age of Ismeran, uh, of, of Ismera, rather. So, it, it, uh, EE is what we use to refer to that time, uh, Ismeran Empire. The age of Ismera was 4,000 years long in total. And what happened was, Unan was a dead planet, but had uh, the right temperature and potential for life. And the Ismerans, these gods, who were able to travel between worlds found Unan and seeded life there on purpose uh, with the intention of giving humanity, they are the gods of humans mostly, uh, the opportunity to, to move there from their original homeworld, which was dying. So uh, in the year one of the Asmeran Empire, first year of the scattering of human uh, kind across the stars, uh, the Esmeran Empire was born, the Old King, whose name has been forgotten, the Old King reigns, and the Esmerans seed life on Unan. This is a collective effort from various gods to make this world habitable. Uh, nine years later, the year 10, the Esmeran Empire, humanity arrives on Unan, and Soligar raises the city of Epacreal for them. So Soligar was a sun god, he was a fire god. Uh, and he was the king of the empire. The The empire did not have an emperor, interestingly enough. Um, 
but they but they did have kings and queens. So the uh, Soligar uh, raised that he was not king at this time because the old king, his father, was the king. Um, but in the year 500 EE, Soligar took the throne. Uh, Epacrial was the gem of the Ismerans. The Ismerans were interesting because they had their own planet. It was called Ismera, which is why they were called the Ismerans, Ismeran gods, they, and it was called the Green World. But it was just for them. They didn't really... It was a small green garden of a world, and they didn't bring humanity with them to Ismera. Instead, really, Unan became kind of the, the capital of humanity, the center of human civilization in the Ismeran Empire, and eventually drew so much trade over the course of those 4,000 years, or almost 4,000 years, that it was, um, it was the center of, of everything, that people from planets all across the Ignaculus galaxy would come and do trade with one another. So, Unan is the young, hip, centralized city planet. It's a multicultural hodgepodge. It's a big planet. There are eight continents, uh, all full of uh, countries and uh, factions and various uh, races. So uh, that's kind of the idea uh, of Unan. Now, after those 4,000 years, uh, there was a war. In the last 50 years of the Ismeran Empire, there was a war called the God War, and the gods went to war with uh, celestial beings called the Numina and Hamir, who were sort of like, um, they were uh, arbiters of change that would appear on worlds uh, at, when celestial bodies aligned, essentially. And they sort of like rode through the skies. They had silver scythes and were responsible for the creation of most shapeshifters and so so the changeling race uh the aya who are higher changelings who can take the form of anything that they see as well as um hybrid races so races that are just one thing like half of one thing and then half of another thing that's them so chimeras uh centaurs uh, maybe not satyrs. I think that's more of a Feywild kind of. Maybe, maybe, maybe satyrs as well. Uh, but that's the, what the Numina and Hamir were were responsible for. Uh, they went to war with the Ismerans, and the dragons went to war with the Ismerans. Now, the dragons in this setting are are very sort of different. Um, there is no classic D and D Tiamat and um, Bahamut, although I'm sure that that interpretations of those figures will exist in uh, various cultures across uh, Ignaculus. But dragons live in their own uh, sort of... It's not even clear if it's a world or its own uh, sort of like plane, um, or if it's a world somewhere specific, but it's called the Sky Above Skies, Ayata. And uh, it allows them to sort of like travel to the skies of any other world that they want. And nobody can follow them back. Uh, so dragons are hunters and bad, but they're but but you know bad news for people because they'll eat people. Um, but a natural part of the world. And the four elder dragons, more ancient even than ancient dragons, uh, who were some of the first beings that came into life in the universe, uh, went to war with the Ismerans. Which was a terrible battle, and there were uh, the Ismerans were wiped out during that fight, and the Elder Dragons suffered two casualties from among their four numbers. It was a big deal. Um, and, and Ismera was broken, and Ismera uh, fell in that time. And it was a bad time for humans because humanity went to war with their gods and all of these races fought against humanity and against the Ismeran gods. Um, but it was, a, it, was a, it was a hodgepodge. It was 50 years of warfare across the galaxy and all kinds of worlds uh, suffered a great deal and, and suffered incredible casualty. So, uh, we come to 
what on this world became known as the Age of Scars. Uh, 430 years post-war uh, of 700, where basically people were trying to rebuild. There, there are these great big rents, tears in, uh, in the earth from like like enormous think um mm, canyons think uh the great canyons um but like made from dragon fire and the the the, the strokes of god weaponry as they fought them uh you know the land was deeply scarred and so there was an era of trying to refertilize the soil trying to uh repopulate after the war and after peace was made trying to uh, reclaim some of the technology and magic that that was left behind in the wake of the gods' deaths and uh, and 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 diving down into these scars to find ruins and find find anything that might have fallen down there. So scar diving became a really big deal and still might be a, a, a rel you know, uh, something that you could do, like dungeon delving, etc. It also makes this world a really uh, viable target for a, an Underdark, especially on certain continents. Um, but yeah, then we reach uh, year 700 post-war, which is the present day. And, uh, or rather, go, going back to the year uh, 430 post-war, um, the worlds start to reconnect with one another. Space travel is invented um, because before there were gates that the gods could make. It's a whole thing. But now there's space travel and there's spaceships. And, uh... Space travel and spaceships. Um, and this world is one once more becoming a trading hub between... Uh, between all these different planets, and now that there are sort of like more in like galactic factions, this world is more of a contested zone. People want to lay claim to it because of its his historical significance. So that's the that's the thinking behind Udnan. Uh, as a as a brief long catch up, uh, dragons that just chill says critical. Uh, travel worlds and eat people that's the dragon life absolutely that's the dragon life and then they you know they grab some stuff and make a horde uh with it but that's yeah uh dragons are super super chill in that way um in that that's often the lifestyle yep 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 yep. so dragons appear on every world because they can just kind of show up on any world that's kind of the idea uh, with dragons and the elder dragons who are, are uh, you know, two of which are still out there. Yay! And the implication being that they are as powerful as they are because of their age. So, in theory, an ancient dragon that lives long enough could become of a similar power to the elder dragons, uh, the, the ones that are out there now, and that the elder dragons themselves, over time, may indeed grow even larger and more powerful than they currently are. So that's, um, that's something to think about. <laughs> um, none of them have yet died of old age. They might, though. You know, one day, a few million years down the line, it'd be kind of fun. Oh, water is good. Talking continuously for that long is truly like a whole thing. Um, I'm just going to check my Facebook. Somebody sent me something. Cool beans. And just respond to that. Um, we've got Ghost of Tsushima playing. Fantastic. And we're back. So yeah, um, let's figure out where let's figure out where some Kagrians live on this world, shall we? And the way that I kind of think of it is that certain races, um, 
that everywhere is sort of multicultural, um, but there might be like certain nations that are more of one race than another, or there might be certain uh, countries where it's they're super against other people coming in, which is kind of weird by the standards of the rest of the world. So uh, most of the world will have humans as like a baseline. There will be some humans in this population, but there might be fewer humans here uh, or more humans here or a greater number of humans. Um, and, and then people just kind of live in, live in wherever they're going to live. You know what I'm saying? So we... We can probably put them in the provinces of Tamazia, actually. <laughs> Owen, welcome! Fantastic to see you here! Um, we've got, well, First Chronicle says, Oh, see now, I want to play a dragonborn with aspirations or delusions to become an elder dragon. Yes! At some point, what we could do it now, I could describe the, uh... What am I, what am I talking about? I could describe the creation of Dragonborn in this setting, which is that they were created, uh, they were a race recently, relatively recently created by the Elder Dragons, um, as a, sort of, um foot soldiers like people who uh would be better able to find out uh humans and like think a little bit more like humans and and could be sort of like ground soldiers so the the idea of like the origin of Dragonborn is that they are only around 750 years old, like in their totality, like as a race. Now, that could be wrong. They could have other origins, but I like the idea that they were created by dragons that but aren't dragons themselves. They are drag draconic humanoids that were just kind of like, we need a thing, let's make a thing, and they made. Uh, Dragonborn. So, that's kind of the idea uh, there. And the, the other races that worship dragons that may have draconic blood somewhere in their past, such as kobolds or lizard folk, are out there and could follow dr uh, dragons' uh, sort of instructions or, or orders if they showed up. But that they, these were like specialized troops that they created. And Dragonborn are, are very, very powerful. Um, no longer soldiers of the dragons necessarily. Some of them might be. But on various worlds sort of now have to figure out what life is for them. So Dragonborns are a relatively new race in that way. What does Owen say? Uh, every race has potential to be dangerous. Yes, indeed. One type of human could kill humans. And another type could too. Bali. I don't understand that. And be right back. Wonderful. Well, well welcome and uh, come back if you like. Dragons can be envious of other races' traits and make something incorporating that. They're too proud to admit it. Um. Yeah, some of them might be like different. Different dragons will have different motivations, and all dragons are deeply. Uh, powerful and magical, so they can do various things. Um, yeah, they, they can do all kinds of stuff. And there is no sort of, like, divide, necessarily, in this overall setting between chromatic dragons and metallic dragons. But that idea could def- like, for the difference between, you know, Tiamat and Bahamut, uh, kind of spawned dragons... Uh, could definitely have originated between, like, a pair of ancient dragons uh, called Tiamat and Bahamut could definitely have, a, you know, warred with one another on a particular world and had reputations and legends that grew into this thing. Um, they just aren't elder dragons themselves. That makes sense. And, uh, and yeah, dragons can have all kinds of different motivations. Um... There's one uh, called Acidrathex, who's a green dragon. is an ancient green dragon with magical power. 
uh, who hates humans from the war and wants to convince the rest of Dragonkind to keep keep killing humans. Um, you know, all kinds of cool stuff. So, uh, the provinces, zah, 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 nations. This is sort of a Yeah, this is a nation in the loosest possible sense. Um, we've got the provinces. Uh, the provinces are led by a figure called the Unrisen One. No, the Freelands aren't led by the Unrisen One. The provinces are led by the Unrisen One. Um... Led by the Unrisen One, which is a basically um, every like the provinces is a is a name for a constantly shifting sort of area of uh, of of, of uh, states or or like city states or countries that have banded together to form a pseudo nation of their own. Um, so let's write this all down. Uh, any collection. Of shifting the states and have come together to form a pseudo country of their own. There. leader, the Unrisen One, is elected by the rulers of each province by majority vote and cannot be included amongst their number as in like anybody who currently holds a position of power cannot go up for uh cannot be selected to be the unrisen one and the the unrisen one it's um uh an election occurs every five years and nobody may claim the title twice but the but the unrisen one has all of the powers of dictatory dictatory uh rulership with all of these other people like sort of like not forming a cabinet but 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 having you know municipal provincial governmental uh rights Owen asks, are there castles? Uh, absolutely there are castles, but we are also getting into an era where spaceships do exist, so there are going to be more modern fortifications uh, as well. Uh, sort of in and amongst the provinces. Um, they have all the powers of a King or president and uh, can mm -mm 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 -mm. muster a quote unquote federal army to defend the provinces. And handles international trade and uh, relations. <laughs> Are they carpenters? I don't know why they form cabinets. Very funny. Uh, <laughs> 
Spaceships like the Death Star. No, not like the Death Star. Uh, specifically, there are no planet-killing spaceships. Although the reason, because basically the reason why the Asmaran gods were were uh, taken out, the right there was a war, was because each of them on their own was capable of destroying a planet. Um, so uh, that's why that's why there, there was a war. Though these people had too much power. And, uh, yeah, yeah, you can't, you can't have that. You gotta get rid of those people who, who are the Death Stars, basically. Um, are there spaceship ranches? Yes, more like the Millennium Falcon. Um, and, uh, I guess a spaceship ranch would be, like, a spaceport? And yes, yes, there are spaceports. Um, <laughs> there are places for spaceships to land on world, and there are spaceships that are too big, to land on world and so they stay in orbit and send uh you know uh transportation vessels down which can be used so cool cool, cool. um right so those are the provinces um do 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 So yeah, 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 yeah. We've got we've got sort of the provinces. I still don't really have a way to delineate nation borders yet, which is a bit of a shame. I really should invest in. Uh, ne next time we come back, uh, next. Do I have anything next Tuesday? No, we're here next Tuesday. I will do uh, do my best to remember to. Uh, actually subscribe to Incarnate and uh, be able to use all of its features, because I'm enjoying it. It's I'm having a good time. The provinces. So, I think amongst the provinces is going to be the... Because the, the provinces are basically, you know, like, a, like a similar to uh, Canada or a United States kind of thing. Um, but let's have... A nation, and it's going to be right on the coast, I think. Uh, or let's have a little island that's not part of the Red Isles. So let's add and go all the way down to one. And let's put an island... Right? No, it was too close to the shore. Yeah. And then subtract one and see if we can't oh no let's undo that is there a way oh i see i see how the thing works so that is the size of just one let's undo that so that's the size that we can make that island fine we've got the island now let's give it a name um it's not cagria it's not anything like that but we want is there a name for this sort of channel that exists in between these two continents? The the uh, stretch. Is there is there a cool name we can sort of? Cause we've got the Prince Edward Islands in Canada. We've got Nova Scotia. Mm. Let's go to our good old friend Google Translate. Let's see what we can do. Uh, First of all, what is uh, what does Nova Scotia mean uh, exactly? You know, um, New Scotland in Latin. That's the what I was uh, looking for. Um, New Scotland. Interesting. Maybe we can make a new version of uh, a place that exists already. Maybe there's like a, they came from somewhere else and they wanted to make a new, maybe not at Helen. Hmm.
uh, is there a country? Let's we got to come up with a country name and then make it maybe like a new version of that country name. Um, 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 um let's just get the let's just get green Zelen. Ooh, Nova Zelen is a nice Gaelic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wayne. Um. Or. Urzelen? Yeah, let's do that. Let's call it Ur Zelen. Uh, and then we can make it much smaller because it is a teeny weeny little island. Urzelen is going to be uh, one of the provinces. Um. So we can start to do little subcategories. Um, or Zelen, a small paradisical, oops, paradisical, uh, Iceland. Province in the provinces um, that is home to many Agrian goat folk. Oh, we've got we've got some more interesting stuff from people. I'll, I'll get to Owen's thing in a moment, but uh, Kieran's got an idea called the Iota Channel. Is that an L or an I? It, I think that's a fantastic idea. Do people want... Oh! Like Ionvos and Tamazia. That's fantastic. The Iota channel. I love it. I actually do. Um... The Iota channel and then... We can. There we go. I wish there was a way of dragging the map. It's a shame there's not. Is there a. No. Um, so if I move Ion Voss over, then the Iota channel can go there and it can go like that and we're happy that's so cool that is so cool thank you so much kieran that's uh that is amazing it's like details like that is what we need um the iota channel and then yes Ur urzalen now urzalen is famous and it's famous for a reason. It's not got the most traffic coming through it. So let's um, not... Uh, it doesn't have the most trade or traffic coming through it. But is known for its beauty. Um... They have a tourism getaway holiday home economy and are famous for uh, hosting a family of magical bakers. And that's as much as I'm going to say about that. But that's just for everybody out there to just keep in your mind. Just keep that in your mind. Uh, let's go ahead and read what Owen has written here. Destroying Jupiter is useless. Uh, or no, the planet is useless. I mean, I guess so. I don't think there's any reason for it not to exist. Um, but yeah, there might be something useful in Stabreeds. Ice and rock, probably. Um, 
Oh, to charge up like um. Oh, you're talking about like uh what s spaceport? Yeah, I mean it's for them to land more than anything. I think that the actual drives will run on sort of an Arcanotech uh engine, so sort of a, a magically fueled uh engine rather than any like particular resource. Um, that feels that feels. Like a, like a good thing. Although they might have sort of like, yeah, sort of like a, a, a resource that can store magic. Um, so you might need to have like one shard or like one crystal of some kind. I don't want to, I want to, I don't want to call them dimeridium. Uh, not dimeridium, that's the witcher. Uh, whatever the, 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 the crystals are in um, Star Trek. But like, It'll last forever, this crystal, but you need it in order to store... It's like a battery. It's like a battery for magical energy. So yeah, there'll be a resource like that. I don't think they need... There'll be, there will be mining facilities somewhere, but uh, your ability to recharge... Yeah, I suppose if you don't have a caster on board, somebody who can produce magical power, then... Um, or, or an advanced enough engine that it can produce its own power, then you might need to land for repairs, you might need to land to get a new crystal, um, you might need to land to have casters imbue it with enough magical energy to get you where you need to go next. So yeah, exactly. Kind of refuel. Deep water delineates nation borders if nobody can swim and boats don't exist. That is true. You're not wrong, Mr. Owen. Um, so yeah, that's why the provinces don't extend over the, the, the border. But uh, in a world where space travel exists, ocean travel definitely does exist as well. And so there's nothing to stop, much like the Romans controlling parts of North Africa, there's nothing to stop nations from crossing borders. Um, so they do, boats do exist, is what I guess, well, kind of, I guess what I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not trying to argue any point. I'm just saying... Uh, yeah, boats, boats definitely do exist. I was just responding to your messages, Owen, that's all. Uh, because I fell behind, and so I was responding to the things you'd said earlier in the chat. Um, article says, spaceports are where you get the tax-free stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that rules similar to airports and stuff apply. Yes, absolutely, because you start to get into disputed national territory. <laughs> uh, I'm sure. I'm sure something like that exists. Yes. Mm. So similar to the provinces and the unrisen one, um, there is another area called the Freelands on Ionvos. Um, which is much more sort of a collection of tribes and peoples, uh, with no particular leader. Except they, like they don't, they don't even elect a leader. Who, uh, it's called the Freelands or the. What was the other name we gave it? The Freelands. Lawless lands. That's that's what uh, people call it. Uh, in a derogatory way, lawless lands. It's a, uh, you know, I think basically there's a land of socio-anarchists who are like, we can create a socialist um, land where we look after one another and we don't need as, as much involvement of government. We can do like city councils and things and, you know, village elders and communicate a commune that way and, uh, and and do trading with one another and try to live in peace with one another without as much interference from government. So that's the sort of idea here. And let's actually write that down. Real lawless lands. Um, a region controlled by various tribes. Plans um, with socio anarchistic uh, ideologies. They believe 
that they can run a fair trade based society where everyone looks after one another without the interference of governments. Uh, they rely on city councils and village elders for leadership, but everyone can have a say. Uh, so that's the idea there. Uh, Shekra Nagol, the Red Isles. So it is worth mentioning here that during the God War, the orcs of the Red Isles refused to take sides. And as punishment, the Esmeran god Joel, the Esmeran god of stone, Joel, mm. uh, destroyed most of the uh, Islands and killed the majority of Orkish people. Some were able to flee off-world. Others remained scattered and divided. In the years since the God War, the Orcs have slowly returned to and restored the Red Isles and are still trying to recover their rich culture and society that were lost in the attack. So that's the idea of like of this idea of like collective recovery. Socio anarchism. Yeah exactly socio anarchism uh fun times for the free lands. Um not Goldtor. What are you saying? Uh, <laughs> Goldtor is unrelated to Joel. Uh, well, at least as far as you are aware. Uh, Joel was one of these Marin gods. He was got a stone. Uh, he was able to turn anything he touched to stone. This is kind of his deal. He was able to walk on water, and where the, he t where his feet touched the water, the water turned to stone. Um, and was a uh, was brutal. He was absolutely brutal and a and a genuinely uh, bad guy. And he killed a lot of orcs. And the orcs were good good cultural cultural artistic people. So that was bad. That was just a bad thing that happened. Um. So yeah, that's one of the named Esmeran gods that people know about. Joel. Let's talk a little bit about Ipacriel. The more we, like, flesh out everything that we've already got, the, the, the richer this is going to feel, and the more we can start to be like, cool, let's talk factions within. For example, let's, like, if you talk about, like, factions within the Freelands, you could get, like, you've got all kinds of very, like, mild people, people with people who genuinely believe in the socio-anarchist, uh, anarchistic uh, ideology, or ideal. And then you could ha have, like, more radical extreme, like, you've got, obviously got, like, the power mongers, the people who want to, you know, insipidly become more powerful. So you've got cults, uh, not cults, but you've got, um, 
you've got people vying for power. So let's, yeah, let's uh, go ahead and say uh, we're going to go to factions. Um, no, actually, let's not go to factions. Let's just go under here and call this, what are we calling this? group um let's call them power mongers and then let's get um radical anarchists and so these are some of the uh and let's let's just get moderates as well um and see if we can Yes, that's exactly what I want. So the factions start to become part of the nations. Um, this is this is better, I think, for my brain anyway. Uh, moderates, uh, those in the free lands that are happy with their society and wish to live peacefully. But we know that living peacefully is not enough for many ambitious people. Greed exists, and it is impossible to stomp out entirely. So, um, let's go to the power mongers, those within the free lands who wish to seize power for themselves and establish a government rule so that they can have more power. And probably there is a specific faction led by a specific person, but let's just let's just get factions down. And then we've got radical anarchists. These are um freelance uh people who wish to expand um the borders of their territory essentially toppling any and all governments on the ooh what do we call it yes the ion voss continent and beyond so people who want to go and topple governments elsewhere Oh god, Goldtor wouldn't do that. No, Goldtor wouldn't do that. Goldtor's a good boy. Um Goldtor's Goldtor's a sweetheart who, who sings, etc. Uh Joel was a god of stone and would have command over Goldtor, would be able to force Goldtor to to do things. But the gods had sort of like extreme power and and particular areas that they invested that power. And Joel Joel was was um more about like creating stone and cracking uh tectonic plates and it was it was all kind of, all, all kinds of stuff um huh <laughs> immortal bow and his not war boys vying for peace for all people under his control ooh i like that I like that. That kind of um that kind of blends the radical anarchists with the power mongers. But I kind of like that they're, they they can be sort of both. Um So these are sort of like the different kind of people who live here, but if we go up to factions instead, what we can get is um faction Immortal Bow and the Not War Boys. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of imagining it's sort of like um, a war paint, kind of like Magic the Gathering, like a gruel inspired uh, group of people from the woods who were kind of like Mad Maxi. And um, yeah, 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 uh, they fight for. Peace and an end to governmental uh, tyranny. Under the direction of their 
infallible leader. Immortal Bow. Now, what race is Immortal Bow? Let's... And, and are they immortal? Because I... Let's go... Let's go throw this in characters. Um, we've got all kinds of crazy... Got crazy effing people. Immortal Bow. Um, totally. No relation to Immortan Joe. Fantastic. I actually... I, I recognize the reference, but I don't know... Like, I, it rings a bell, rather, but I actually don't know who Immortan Joe is. We're gonna, we're gonna look it all up. Immortan... Immortan Joe. Oh, it is! It's Mad Max! Okay, fantastic. I was... You, you were saying it, it was like, I'm getting real Mad Max vibes off of this guy. And <laughs> that's exactly what you were doing. Uh, I love it when things go right over my head, but it works out in the end. It's good. Um... So yeah, let's 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 find a race. Let's go to a little wiki and find a race for this person. Immortal bow. Um. Oh, you know what we could do? We could do something like a reborn or a revenant. Um. So somebody who's like an undead or someone who doesn't appear to be undead immediately oh can he be a gnome i mean he can <laughs> yeah and there are some really interesting gnome sub races actually let's go ahead and look forest gnome rock gnome deep gnome mark of scrivening gnome or maybe it was halfling that i was thinking of because there are ghost wise halflings that can do cool stuff um, yeah, it could be, what do we, what do we say? It's like a forest gnome in our town. Undead, undead sounds cooler than gnome. It does sound cooler than gnome, to be fair. And I had an idea for, for, uh, yeah, who it might be for, for something about it. Um, hmm. We're not going to spend a huge amount of time on this character, but it's but it's uh, but it's, it's really fun. Uh, I do like. You know what? Let's not make it a gnome. Let's not make it a gnome. Uh, let's make it let's make it an undead, but an undead of what race? Um, an undead of what race? Ooh, because we could do some, we could do some really interesting stuff here. And what, what, what races do we currently have? Because we, we included all the ones from uh, Rayara. We could make it a, an undead... Um. Yeah, let's make it an undead satyr. Is that what we want to do? No, 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 no. Let's do, let's do an undead human. Let's do an undead friggin. No, no, no. let's do an undead satyr. Undead satyr is so cool. Um. I think as an idea, um, uh, an undead reborn spader. Yes, who uh, wishes to topple all governments and curses the quote-unquote old gods of Esmera. Immortal Bow. Cool character. Thank you kindly for the, uh, for, for the suggestion. Um, let's go back up to our nations. 
And, uh, ooh, where is the free lands? If it's anywhere near the Red Isles, it could be an undead orc and have a vendetta against Joel and use that to influence his believers. Very possible I, uh, idea. I kind of, I kind of, you know, I made it a satyr, but there's no reason for it not to be a satyr. Um, it isn't that far from the Red Isles either. You're, you make, you make a convincing argument, Kieran, and I, and I want to follow you down there. So let's, let's say, um, let's say orc, um, which Tubble all governments and curses the old gods of Ismera. Um, yes, driven by hatred of Joel and frustration that they died before they could have their revenge on them. Um, yeah, Bo. Uh, Bo was maybe, maybe they were, uh, was, uh, was drowned, uh, escaping from the Red Isles. When Joel attacked. But, uh, returned to unlife when they washed up on the shores of the Free Lands. Hatred of humans who go alongside their hatred of the gods and of government and i think probably um uses the anarchist uh a ideology to motivate their followers when in actuality they simply want a war with the northern human kingdoms of Epacriel and the Eorvan Empire. What a what a character that you have thrown my way. I I love Immortal Bow as somebody to populate this. That makes this world so much more rich. I I adore it. Go. Seizing upon the opportunity to mass followers, he vilified an already unruly Joel and his actions to rise to power. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's been 700 years since Joel died. Probably 710, 715 years. Um, since Joel died? Oh, uh, so any, any followers that he could have gotten that way, he probably got for the duration of, or they probably got for the duration of the God War, and then when the God War ended, that was no longer an adequate motivation, um, for their followers. Uh, so they'd have to find another one, and so the anarchist sort of movement in the freelance was something they, they attached on to. But that's a, that's a great idea. Um, and then Owen's got a great little thing in the chat here saying, an immortal golem. Now, you have hit upon something incredibly important for the world building of Unan, and that is something called Edifitra. I have been wanting to drop Edifitra in for a while, but they weren't on Rayara because that was Mayra's uh, territory, and... Um, oh yes, sorry, uh, Kieran, if I wasn't clear enough. The Esmerans all, were all wiped out during the God War 700 years ago. Um, it may be, uh, the reason it's confusing is because on Saigalia, when we were doing the Tenth Kingdom campaign, uh, stay tuned for that, people of the world, um, on the world of Vulbakar, 
there are still two who are alive. So they were sort of like disconnected from the rest of the Empire and everybody thinks that they're dead, but they are the last two alive. Uh, Darafel and Serifiel on, on Volpicar. But the rest of them in the present day, it's been 700 years since they were all killed. Um, Immortal Golem is super important because uh, Edifitra are a thing. Um, let's go ahead and throw into the monsters category. Ed Ifitra Ran. So on Marazion is the Edifitra Yima, I believe. Um, but the Edifitra Kran was here. A uh, Titan um, powered by an Unamet orb and housing uh, the most advanced artificial intelligences to date. The Edifitra were Peacekeepers um, commissioned and built by the King Erinor when he rose to the Esmeran throne. Uh, they imposed order and were universally despised by the people of Unan. A rebellion against the Edifitra Ron uh, resulted in its destruction. Though the majority of its body has yet to be recovered. So, the Edifitra Kron is like a titanic AI golem. Yeah. Um, who was once sort of a tyrannical dictator on this world and a peacekeeper and would just kill you if you didn't do what the Esmerans wanted you to do. Ah. Uh, yep, 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 yep. And the number. Goodness me. Love a good titan. Absolutely, Karen. This thing was awesome. And took a lot of killing to do. Very Shadow of the Colossus sort of uh, fight. But obviously it was bigger than that. It was much bigger than that. And was able to create Warforged of its own. And a lot of Warforged in the wider Ignaculous Galaxy. Although, you know, robotics are definitely a thing. And there are different kinds of constructs all over the place, a lot of Warforged were created by Edifitra. Edifitra Yima, Edifitra Kron, any number of these guys across various worlds. So different Warforged will have different temperaments based on which one created them. The Edifitra Kron, like, you know, it, for example, on Mad Zion, the Edifitra Yima was very um, large-scale in its thinking, was very... Um, would make, like, big calculated moves. Uh, and, like, big sweeps across society, whereas the Edifitra Kron, I think, um, was a bit more interested in how to inspire or break the morale of people. So, yeah, yeah, uh, was interested in the breaking points of people's spirits. 
<laughs> PhD has forever influenced my view of Warforged, Alberta. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, co I, I just completely agree. And maybe there was an Edifitra out there who was, like, really nice and, like, in tune with nature. And there are Warforged going around with tree arms out there. Who were just, like, the kindest souls ever. And they did, like, Red Cross um, humanitarian aid during the war. But, uh, yeah, the, uh, the Warforged are just babies in this, and, I mean, there are, there are Warforged from before that, but specifically, like, Warforged, uh, machines were, you know, forged during the God War. Um, a lot of things are very new in this setting. A lot of things are very, like, just getting started. So that was kind of a thing. Uh, so yeah, Edifitra Kron's dead, and they haven't found his body yet. Well, they will eventually. That's where the scar died, and we we'll find his body. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Let's put the Halsa in Ion Voss. Basically, there's a giant river that flows next to a pack rail. And it's a well documented river. We're gonna put it there. <laughs> I think it runs from north to south. Does it run through the Freelands? Hmm, maybe. It's such, a, it's such an enormous river. Um, yeah, it goes north. And doesn't pass by Yorva because Yorva is sort of desert-y. But that's the Halsa. The kind of... Ooh, I like how it kind of bifurcates that continent. Yeah, 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 yeah. I like that a lot. Let's go ahead and <laughs> um, do that. The Alsa. It's just sort of a thing. Yeah. Good days. Good times. Happy days. Zoom right in on that. The Halsa. So, yeah, e Eorva is more in a sort of like a deserted flatlands area. Uh, but a pack rail was built right on a river. Or the river, actually. The low Nile. Ha! <laughs> uh, no, this one, this one's called the Halsa. And uh, this was a river uh, that was uh, created by the god Quenox. Uh, sort of a moon and tide and ocean water god of the Asmarans. So, all kinds of things like that. Now, let's go back to Unan, and I wanted to talk briefly about mythology and the way that uh, the God War bifurcated, sort of, like, di di really divided people on the Asmaran gods. Um, because, so, because everybody had to choose a side. Everybody had to choose a side. And the... There were a lot of gods who died on Unan, and there yet a future died on Unan, and the Asmarans were fighting to protect this 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 hub of their home. So you know what? I'm I, I actually might retcon what happened with the Edifitra Kron. Um, keep yeah. Um, they imposed order and were universally despised by the people of who of Unan. Um, until the God War came. Then, the Edifitra Titan uh, created an army of Warforge and fought alongside the gods Erenor and Arcyon to protect the world of Unan. And I think I think this is another part of the reason why people are so divided is because for so many years, for a thousand years, the Edifitra Kron was uh, tyrannical and was it was a terrible, terrible influence on the world. But in those last years during the God War, when the gods were fighting for their survival, he was protecting the world. He was trying to fight against the dragons. 
So yes, um, this fighting and pro. Oh uh, well, it died. Yeah, it died. Protecting the world. So the majority of his body body has yet to be recovered. Um, was interested in the breaking points of people's spirits and in a leader's ability to rally and raise morale. Hello, friend. Carrie! Carrie, welcome to the stream! I'm so glad that you could join us! Oh, pandas! Yay! Or panchams, should I say. I apologize. Um. <laughs> Amazing. Um, yeah, so we were just talking. We were just talking out of future, and now we're going to talk about. Uh. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, mythology, and you know what? Actually, current world state is probably where this goes more than anywhere else. Um, today, the people's oops of Hunan are divided on what to think about the Esmeran gods. Some believe that the Gods are not dead, or that they shall return from the lands of death someday in the future to reclaim their empire. Others know the Truth. The gods are dead and will not return. Still more division lies in whether they were a positive influence or not. The people of Unan suffered under the rule of Erinor for over 1,000 years. However, during the God War, The Edifitra Kron, as well as both the gods Erinor and Arcyon, gave their lives protecting the planet. So we will keep going with that in a second, but let's read some chat. Uh, hello! Is there importance to collecting the entirety of an Esmeran god's body? Yeah, what? <laughs> Interesting you say that, Kira. All I'm going to tell you, because that's plot related, but all I will tell you is um, there could only be benefit in collecting the body of a god. Yes. What exactly that benefit could be, I don't necessarily want to share with you. Um, I would cover with work. So any wholesome content is appreciated. It's good your streams. That is so lovely. Thank you so much for the wonderful far fetch with the hearts. It's a beautiful little thing. And thank you for joining. Um, we're currently talking about people being divided on whether gods were good or not. I don't know if that counts as wholesome content, but you are more than welcome. This is stuff that... Ooh, Gary! You're here. I have something to share with you in a second. Well, I'll finish reading this and then I'll share something with you. Um, you're gonna like this. This is cool. Or is it religious? Really oh, you're saying, why do they want to find the Edipetra Kron's body? I will share that with you in a second. Curry, 
A special item on this line for magical bakers. <laughs> this is for Porky. This is exactly what I was about to share with you. Yes. Just hanging out with buddies is awesome enough. Good. Good, 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 good. Let's go to the world. Ursulen is part of the provinces. And it's at the base of the Iota Channel between Ion Voss and uh, Tamazia. And Urzalen would be where your character would be from! Would be where Pokyorg is from! Um, so yeah, that kind of idea that... Um, Burn and Pokyorg, put anyone in line with them! Yeah! Uh, and here's what I've written for, uh, for that area. <laughs> Urzalen, a small paradisical, par paradisical island in the provinces that is home to many Cagrian. It doesn't have the most trade or traffic coming through it, but is known for its beauty. They have a tourism slash getaway holiday home economy and are famous for hosting a family of magical bakers. So there you go. Welcome. And uh, this is uh, this is uh, where you your guys will be set. So there you go. Uh, it also means that I might be able to... I don't want to spoil things! I can't spoil things! Uh, um, all that I'm going to say is that I'm super excited and that basically being able to flesh out this corner of this massive world um, may actually be enough for this stream, may be enough for, uh, for our purposes. If you, if you know what I'm saying, if, if you know what I'm saying. So, um, where were we going? Yes, so this is a, this is a big deal. Um, the recovery of the bodies of the Edithetra Titans were mm, Titans and the subsequent reverse engineering of the technologies used in their creation uh used um were the key components in crafting the new technologies that have made interstellar travel possible without the Esmeran's Unarl gates. Basically, um, recovering an A or A Titan's body sends one's technology forward hundreds of years all at once. This is very reminiscent of the uh, Prothean technology found on Mars during the uh, the Mass Effect uh, games. So the um, the idea that there's like an ancient civilization uh, where you, you you could um, you could find their technology and it, it allowed them, for them to find it, the Mass Effect realize and become part of uh, this uh, galactic community. And it was very much the same for the Edifitra Titans. The fa most famous ones that were recovered there's an, uh, was the Edifitra Titan Yima on Mata Zion, which has allowed for the construction of basically a... Uh, um, an encryption programs capable of keeping artificial intelligences out of computer programs. So Metazon's main export is in basically like intelligent firewalls that are um, necessary to keep uh, artificial intelligences and, you know, specially crafted warforged out of your computers. Um... So that's like the technology that they were able to create. And they're also like the leaders in cybernetics because of that. So they have a very, very potent technology um, export uh, in the Anaran assembly. Um, there's also the 
Edifitra Titan on Muranar, which allowed for the uh, invention of spaceships and the invention of space travel between the, the, the ones in the Inaran Assembly. There is one that was on the uh, on Dahiri Prime, which allowed for them to do inter um, like with a interplanetary travel, just like uh, you know, slower than light, which is STL, which is which still still travel is what it's called because that's that's kind of fun and I I like that. Um, still travel between uh, planets within their own solar system, but they didn't get d gate technology, which is the thing that uh, the Edo Future Titan on Muranar was able to give them. Um, and the last one that we know about is the Edifitra Titan that was on Rizal, and the uh, the Seraphs of Rizal are these incredibly durable, um, sort of like fire in their veins, um, and uh, uh, angelic, brutish uh, people, and they, when they were able to reverse engineer the technology of their Edifitra Titan that they destroyed, uh, were able to create exosuits, basically like Iron Man suits of armor that allow them to traverse space and fight with the capability of an entire starship on their own. Um, so they have an army, even though they are a only one planet with a smaller population, they're able to fight on the same level as the entirety of the Inaran Assembly and the entirety of the Dahiri Empire um, as sort of like a major third faction because they found one of these Edifitras. So finding them is a really big deal and can al allow for an incredible amount of power sh shift and wealth in the world. So it is incredibly important to find uh, the Edifitra Kron because it was not found. Oh, for the Porgy's Bakery, I think it'll just be called the the Erswef, uh Bakery. Oh, yes, fantastic. The name is famous enough in those parts. Absolutely, I'm gonna eat some chocolate. Um, what? But I'm gonna write that down because I can't, uh, I can't stand it. I gotta write it down. Mm-hmm. All right, did I write it down properly? Air swept the yes, haha. -ha. Victory, and then see the collection of a god's body, possible holy relics, it needs paladins and a crusade. Now you're starting to get the idea. Yes, absolutely. This is less for Unan proper. Although there would definitely be people from the Crusade. But the Dahiri Empire is made up of humans who worshipped the gods, worshipped the Ismeran gods, and wish to recover their bodies. And it just, it's, there's a problem though. A lot of the bodies of the gods are on worlds that aren't controlled by the Empire. And the reason that they were so aggressive in their expansion was, in fact, because they wanted to reclaim worlds on which Asmeran gods perished so that they could recover the Asmeran gods' bodies. Unan holds, in theory, the bodies of Arcyon, Erenor, the Edifitra Kron, and I think Joel died here as well. Let's just say that he did. Because he was a butthead. Um, no, I know that his mother died on his Mara. So did the dragons get his body? Let's keep it simple and say that just Erenor and Arceon died on Unan. We can figure out where Joel died later. Um, hmm. Expansion with a secret purpose. I think that this is a... Faction... Within the Tahiri Empire, the Crusade. Yes. Um, collection of the God's Body, possible holy relics, the needs paladins of Crusade. Mm, it's so true. It's so true. They're trying, and you know, the Tahiri Empire as a whole is influenced by, much like, you know, 
uh, governments are uh, influenced by like the NRA or by the the the, the crazy Catholic Church in the states, um, or by the actual Catholic Church run by the Pope in Italy, uh, <laughs> in Rome. Yeah. So let's um, let's go to factions. Tahiri Empire. Um. Let's call it the Green Crusade, because this mirror was the Green World. The Green Crusade are a religious order from the Hiri Prime, whose intention is to recover the bodies and works of the Esmeran gods and bring them to their rightful resting place amongst they their people humanity uh, to this end they influence the empire the Tahiri Empire, not to be confused with the Esmeran Empire, uh, into capturing worlds on which Esmeran gods perished. This led to the creation of the Anaran Assembly. So now what we get is a a race on Unan for those secrets, those scar divers who are trying to find the bodies of these gods before one another. Oh, this is so this gets so good. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Thank you, Kieran. You're asking the right question. You're, 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 these are things that I was going to get to, but you're asking the right questions to prompt me to get to them sooner, which I really appreciate. So let's go back to current world state. Um, uh, doodly doodly do. People do not are divided on what to think of the Esmeran gods. Uh... Those who fought on the side of Esmera believe that the gods were just and that they should continue to live in accordance with their teachings. Those who fought against the Empire believe that the gods were evil and their destruction a punishment for their cruelty and hubris. There is currently a race on to find the bodies of Erinor and Arcyon, as well as the body of the Eddie Vitracron. The best guess that anyone has is that those bodies fell into the Quote, scars, great, uh, raking gashes in the earth that go down for some distance and lead into subterranean caverns and networks under dark the green crusade 
from the Ikiri Empire is here pouring resources into the hunt and others both from Unan and across the Anaran assembly are racing against them or trying to keep them from their goal. Ha! I know we're not looking for it, but I like the religion versus religion versus government versus free people idea. <laughs> Just all different strides that anyone could pick up from as a PC's POV. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if any of this, like, you want to influence uh, your character, um, because I think, I think, you know, cats out of the bag a little bit, uh, from the way that this, this stream has gone, that we are, we're, we're thinking about doing a new campaign at some point down the line, and, uh, beginning on Unan and having characters, uh, within the Ignaculous Galaxy, which is really, really fun. Um, so, Kieran, you know, you, you still have to think about, uh, what kind of character you want to play and what you know, sort of their their deal is and what the motivation is but all of this I, these streams this world all of the stuff we're throwing in there can all sort of influence uh just like uh, just like all these different like that's very much the idea of unan is that there are so many different ways of looking at what has happened, what is currently happening. There are all of these different perspectives, all these different factions that aren't necessarily mutually exclusive you know you can play a socio-anarchist from the free lands who joins the green crusade and wants to look for uh the body of a god just like a weird mix m mishmash of different things um but but uh but yeah so that's that's sort of like a a current conflict kind of thing concepts and conflicts um oop race to find the bodies of the Esmeran gods and the Epic Vitra. Hey bodies, the Epic Vitra crown, hell yeah. Totally, totally, hell yeah! Ooh, so we've got mythology, we've got current world today, we've got, well, let's keep going with sort of the nations and tribes thing. Um, yes, 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 um, let's turn this into, yay, um, let's talk about Iorva, um, so we're still kind of on the same continent, we're still filling out all of the information about the factions that we, we, we see, sort of on and around Ion Voss, you know, and, and on Tamazia. But I think that, I think that's okay. I think we can be forgiven for focusing in on a, a landmass the size of Europe and, uh, and West Asia. You know what I'm saying? Like, there is a lot of land here and, and the, the lack of specifics involved in going like, eh, the free lands, where it's all these different kinds of people. It's like, there's so, there's so much more detail that would have to be thrown into the free lands if that was somewhere where, you know, for example, in a campaign, pe people actually wanted to go. It's like, eh, can I go to the free lands or could I set a character's backstory in the free lands and be like, yeah, absolutely, you can do that. I'm going to need to come out, like, do an entire new writing session just based on that to see, like, all of the complexities of that. Very much the same with um, the provinces. You know, we've got one of the provinces, which is Urzalem, but there can be all kinds of provinces in there. Maybe there's a specific number um, to keep things simple. Maybe there's, like, maybe there's ten. Just going off of a Canadian sort of uh, background. Maybe there are ten provinces that make up the provinces of Tamazia. Uh, and then there are, are like a few other nations that aren't involved in the provinces, you know, further south in this kind of area of Tamazia. Uh, and then we sort of have Ionvos and Tamazia. We've got, you know, Shekranagol. 
Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of like going like, oh man, we're not even going, we aren't even going to talk about Hexat. We're not even going to talk about them. What's their whole deal? I don't know. I've been watching a lot of Arcane recently, and Hexat kind of sounds like Hextech. And that's a sort of like Piltover technology that they end up creating. And it's super cool. And in D&D, they had a uh, crossover with uh, Rune Terra, which is the world of um, League of Legends. Specifically, a city called Bilgewater, and there are a few subclasses now for... Let me show you what we're talking about, because my wonderful girlfriend, uh, who is just inspired and gorgeous and everything, uh, put me on to the fact that there are a few of these subclasses from something or uh, uh, called... Yes, The Legends of Runeterra, Dark Tides of Bilgewater. Um... Which just sends you here. That's not what I want. Um, for example, the Fighter Renegade, which has uh, sort of a scrounged, personalized Hextech gun or a sniper rifle, which is so cool. And I was looking at Barbarian, I believe was the one I was looking at. Uh, let's have a quick peek at Barbarian, because I think they've got one as well. And I haven't actually read what the subclass is, but I just saw, hey, that's from the same Legends of Runeterra, Tides of Dark Tides of uh, Bilgewater. Uh, we've got a, a Barian, Barbarian Path of the Depths, which is really, really cool. Um, with Hexat, they better make technologies, and Bilgewater is a crazy place in League of Legends. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um... Gift of the Drowned Ones. Okay, so this is sort of the same area as like a like a Fathomless Warlock kind of thing. Um, Dredge Line. Oh, you manifest an extra appendage. Cracking Tentacle, Giant Anchor, Preternatural Claws. So sort of a mix with this like Simic, Simic Hybrid kind of thing. Ghost Water Dive. Burst into the water of the Tyrael somewhere else is an action. That's already very cool. Manifestation of the Deep. Additional adaptations, the deep eyes, arms, heart, soul, and armor. And then depth charge. Ghostwater dive ability you can choose to appear with a wave of tidal force. Very cool. So yeah, these these are super well written. They're they're actually fantastic. Um I won't dive too far down that rabbit hole, but Hexat feels like a technology thing. Hexat and pirates, yeah, they're sort of a pirate feel. Or you're talking about bilge water because that 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 makes a lot of sense from what I understand about the League of Legends lore. That yeah, bilge water is insane. Um, the League of Legends lore is really cool, and uh, and I would never have caught on to it if it hadn't been for the arcane League of Legends series on Netflix. Which, if you haven't seen, I very highly encourage you to go check out. It's great. It's so good. Um, I have a couple of nitpicks, but they are truly nitpickish. It's wonderful. It's it's a masterclass in visual storytelling, and um, the characters are great. The characters are great, and uh, Caitlin and Vi are so good together. Make it official. Stop being afraid of China, right? Let let the writers let the writers have a lesbian relationship. It's so clear. It's good. It's great. Um, where pirates come from, I think. Cool. Yeah, I mean, we can do, like, a cursory sort of thing on Hexat now. Continents. We've got... Uh... Yeah, um... Hexat. And... Technologies. Um... Pirates? Question mark? Uh... <laughs> Um, Tamazia is home to the provinces. Uh, and other shenaniganeries. Actually, let's go ahead and make all of these. Fifteen's fine. And then, I don't know what I did there, but... Making that back down to a 12. Making that back down to a 12. Hexat. 
do, 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 do. We can keep throwing ideas at different um, continents as they come, but we can throw that on there. We also know Talaris is where we're going to do. Talaris is where we're going to do some uh, Elven shenanigans. Shen and Gans. Yay! I'm going to do a quick peek at Facebook. Leave it now. Depending on how Immortal Bow turns out, there's a chance. Easy. Ooh. So I shouldn't read any of this aloud. This is a. This is. A, this is something different. Give me the one second. I just want to read something. Okay. Um. Don't speak aloud. Don't speak aloud. <laughs> when it comes to that uh yes so we're not gonna really we're not talking about that so much let's let's go back to here and i keep saying let's talk about yorva let's talk about apocryphal let's actually do those things um yorva is a uh a city-state so basically the idea i had was that yorva was sort of like based on rome um Yeah, so so uh based on Rome in its early days that has conquered its city state neighbors and become an empire in its own right. Um, it is led by, I'm going to get the name wrong. Damn it. What was the guy's name? Uh, I'm going to pull up a little word document where I keep some other stuff. Oh, wait. Or oh, did I? Did I? No, I did. I, I, I got it. It's in the characters. Um, Inu Avahi. Yes. Uh, led by Inu Avahi. That name is going to be important, so hold on to your hats, kittens. Um, it's led by Inu Avahi, a seraph originally from Rizale. Rizale is a very important planet. We're definitely going to go there one, at some point. Uh, in one of these building worlds things. Um, yeah, Rizale is like just hyper important and it was a it was a central battlefield for the God War. Uh, a lot of really, really incredible races, uh, homebrewed races. Three of them that I can name right now actually because um, Seraphs, Prianu, and... Dreltar came from there. There were also Tabaxi who lived there. Humans had a colony there. Um, dragons would hunt. And it was basically like the most enormous mountains you could possibly think of. And then sort of like the valleys in between the mountains. So really, really cool. Yorva. Land of inspirational thinkers, intense generals, and inspiring diplomats. I like that. Yeah, I like that a lot, actually. Ooh, do, Karen, do you mind if I steal that wholesale? I might just steal that wholesale. That's just straight up cool. Where did I put this stuff? I mean, I know it's here, but... <laughs> That's in century.
amazing. It's so, it's such, so good, so good. And that's like, that, that can be their sort of like tagline really for, um, for the rest of the world. But they are an empire and they are led by a seraph. And seraphs are, God, they're hard to kill. They're so hard to kill. Um, a seraph originally from Azale. Seraphs are insanely hard to kill. And Inu Avahi has led Yorva to military dominance in Ion or on on the continent. On the continent of Ion Voss. Now they seek to mend relations with their neighbors who think them blood thirsty. Yonva, land of inspirational thinkers, intense generals, and inspiring diplomats. I love the, uh, the, the triple I thing that you did there, Kieran, where it's like, Eorva, inspirational, intense, and inspiring. And it's so good. It's just all of the eyes. Eyes. The eyes have it. I. Hmm. Cool beans. So Eorva is a... Eorva is a big deal. Um, they are a newly minted, very, very militarily, uh, adept power. And there is no one government that represents Unan on the sort of Anaran Assembly stage. So there are diplomats from all kinds of countries from Unan that, that sort of make appearances. And definitely Iorva will be one of the ones represented. Um, and they definitely, they want a seat at the table and the interesting thing that people will note about Inu Avahi is that he's a seraph, but he does not run with the other seraphs of Rizal. It does not part. It's not part of the Rizalian overarchy. Um, so let's go ahead and, and just find Inu Avahi, seraph emperor. He does not run with or associate with the. Rizalian Overarchy. That's the other Seraphs are a part of. Rather, he has carved out his own territory. And I think this is going to come from the fact that Inu was separated from his people um, after the God War when travel between the stars became impossible. He built the Jorvan Empire and now does not want to relinquish what he has created. So it's like, it's one of those things where he has more power here now than he would have if he was just part of the Rosalian overarchy. And, like, even though he should be with his people and doesn't really belong here, here he has more power. And so he decided to, to stay. Um, He's a... He's a bad guy, but you can kind of see he's like trying to make the best of a situation where he was like he was alone. He was alone. Um, so that's that is kind of a thing. That's kind of a thing. And he's got a general, he's got he's got a general called Gaius. Human 
general of the Yorvan Empire. Um, you want to consult uh, corpse speaker in the employ of Inu uh, Vaki. So there are all these characters that sort of like, re you know, starts to do 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 um, expand out from there. Let's go, let's go way right back up. Now let's talk about a pack reel. Now a pack reel is a, this, this was known as the, known as the jewel of the as Marin Empire or the jewel of the green world. This holy city was built by Soligar to house the newcomers, the human newcomers, to Hunan in the year 10 EE, which, to put that in perspective, was 4,000... No, um, yeah, 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 4,690 years ago. So, it's a city with a long, long history. Uh, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to go through it one at a time, but first, Kieran has put something in the chat, let's read it! Uh, I'm pulling a little from Warhammer, but are you treating the end of the Ismeran War like the Dark Age or the Age of Darkness? I don't know Warhammer well enough to know whether I am doing a, a, a reference to that or the Age of Darkness. It wasn't an Age of Darkness, but it was... Here's... Kind of it was an Age of Darkness. Basically... The Ismerans connected all of these worlds, and after the war, the Unarl gates that they used to do so were broken. And therefore, communication between all of these worlds just stopped for around 400 years. 400 years is around the amount of time that it took for the Erzuli of Rayara and the Centaurs of Muranar to re-establish contact with one another, and create the first spaceships use and that which used gate tech which is the uh, technology that allows for uh space folding jumps through through uh the vastness of space and slowly over the next few hundred years uh more and more planets were rediscovered and this technology spread to the point where now we've got a functioning uh system again but things have changed a lot of new players are in town, and uh, and it's, it's it's a very chaotic. Things are not stable anymore. We're definitely living in, you know, the the ruins of a bygone advanced era. And while technology is still advancing, and people are creating their own, you know, advancements, because the idea that you know, technology would be lost forever, I think is a little bit crazy, if I'm being entirely honest. Um, unless there was a reason. Like, Mass Effect goes out of its way to, to give a specific reason why there are, you know, ancient, advanced technologies. And I think these merits left behind a great deal of advanced technology, which they had for themselves, which is now being reverse-engineered, and may not yet be as potent as what the gods were using. Uh, or it may not be able to be used in the same way that the gods were using it, but uh, people are able to do versions of those things. So they may not be able to create artificial intelligence at, as sophisticated as the Edifitra yet, but are definitely able to create artificial intelligences and create Warforged of their own. Now, they might be more like nimble rights from uh, Dragon Ice Waterdeep, who are sort of like wooden constructs, rather than sophisticated warforged with with uh, with free will. Um, but they might have free will. They might have you know minds of their own. They might be limited a little bit in their bodies and what they can do. But the technology is advancing. Um, you know, 
the the gate tech uh by the way gate tech is a company who invents this technology and 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 capitalist wise spreads it around we got to talk about gate tech at some point actually i'm going to write it down in the factions um Pacme Corp. Gate Tech.
to do. Hello, everybody. I am back. I apologize for nothing. I am great. All of this is good. Ooh. We're reacting to my thing. Great. Okay. We're back. We're in factions. Let's continue with Unan. Uh, we've done... Right. So... <laughs> Yes, we began on a pack rail with all of its history. Uh, 4,690 years ago. Holy crap, uh, is what I say to that. Holy crap. A long time ago. It's almost back to Egypt. Um, okay, uh, so that's when the city was first built. Um in the days of the empire the city continued to expand and eventually it became a place uh, a meeting place for peoples from across the galaxy Uh, while not perfect by any means, the city known then also as the White City for the color of its walls. Got to be the tallest city viewable from anywhere a new non by its spires or lights. I like the idea of it being tall now that you mention it. Um, I don't know that it was so tall that it could be seen anywhere on the planet, uh, because it was still designed because like it was it was designed for humans to live there. But the idea that a god made it. Uh, and there was something almost more than natural about it. I like that it's tall. Let's say not to the level of mountain tall. Uh, it's next to the river. I don't think it was a mountain that it was that was built into. But I think absolutely like skyscrapers, like far beyond the Empire State Building. Let's 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 talk CN Tower. Let's talk the the tower in Dubai. Um. I, I like that. I like that, absolutely. Um, White City for the color of its walls. Or the City of Spires for the height of its skyscraper buildings. Like Dubai Tall. Exactly like Dubai Tall. Um... Uh, became the positive base for humanity. The new sentient race amongst the denizens of the galaxy. Because, again, like you have to uh, remember as well that humanity joined the galactic stage in the first year of the Ismeran Empire's reign. So they had one planet that they lived on that hadn't made contact with many other planets at all. I mean, there had been a, little, a small amount of contact from individuals from that planet, but not on, on such a big level. So humans had not evolved on other worlds. They evolved on one planet. And then the Ismeran gods led them from that dying world... Uh, and scattered them, and they made colonies everywhere, and Unan was a world that was specifically cultivated for humans to live on. Uh, and humans went and lived on all these different worlds. They lived and lived on Rayara, and Sekahashis, and Muranar. They went and lived on um, all the planets in the Dahiri system, and on uh, a planet called Melikan, um, and Ipianalshrem. And all of these, all of these different planets. Um, and Rizale. 
and uh, on Vor, all kinds of places. So, uh, we will eventually we will eventually get to them all. We're only on world number three, believe it or not, and we haven't even scratched the surface of this one. I feel like we have so much more that we can explore on each of the worlds that have been explored so far. And in fact, I mean, we're, we've been doing it sort of a three shot based on Rayara, and I have personally, you know, with some high school friends, run a uh, one shot set on Sekahashis. I know that a friend is planning on doing something on Rayara because they think that that world is cool, which is so fun. I'm very flattered indeed. Uh, and then we've got Unan, which we, you know, there's a lot of planning and stuff that goes into this for, you know, for the future. Um, these writing sessions end up being a lot of sharing, a lot of collaboration and talking, and I love it. And it's so much fun. Um, if I, being entirely honest, I would get a lot more done if I wasn't talking. <laughs> um, no, but these, these are, these are fun. And I think I'm, I'm really like, just, this is me. This is session six. This is after six or seven weeks, seven, well, sorry, seven weeks um, of doing this because it was a week off because Christmas break and stuff. Uh, and I've been trying to figure out how to do online content regularly for a long time. And I feel like this is a, this is fun. This is just fun to do. Super, I'm super glad that I started doing it. There, uh, there's a little moment. Talking about a pack reel, uh, uh, amongst the denizens of the galaxy. So, all was well for a long time, but then it wasn't, because we go to the history, and in the year 2553 EE, Arceon destroyed a pack reel. Um, there's a whole story about why this happened, and... Uh, and, uh, and this, 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 this butthead, um, and then it wasn't classic. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> everything was good. And then it wasn't. <laughs> uh, we're back. A pack reel. So let's leave it then. Um, in the next chapter of a pack reel. We've got, it was destroyed in the year 2553 EE, which was how many <laughs> years ago? I know exactly how many years ago this was because of reasons. Um, years ago, so that's uh, 2,107 years ago. Holy heck. Very funny. I'm having, a, I am having a, 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 an absolute blast. And I like all of these worlds are places that I'm so excited to explore and having you guys along and uh, offering ideas and being able to chat about various parts is, is a, just a true delight. I had no idea I was going to have this much fun doing this. I, I truly did not know that I was going to have this much fun. So, uh, thank you guys for being here and hanging out. <laughs> um, I'm glad it's fun for you as well. Um, so, uh, golden age of... Golden, golden age. Golden age of Epacriel lasted. And now we <laughs> split the difference between... Um, the year 10, well, I guess 2,543 years. 2,543 years. So that's a long time for a city to exist. And I imagine it became quite a sprawling, fantastic, you know, skyscraping uh, monument of the age. It was, it was probably the most technologically advanced. Uh, people here had, a, had you know, sort of like fantastic lives. Um, There's a lot of wealth that went into this place. It was it was a true metropolis and like a really really fantastic, fantastic place. 
and then it was destroyed in the year 2553 bullet uh 2107 years ago by the god Arcyon. um who was the prince uh and son of Soligar, he was banished for this crime. And the uh, land became uninhabitable and deserted. So that was the next thing that happened but we reached the end of the god war so in the final wow final year of the god war well when was it that 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 arcyon came actually and cleansed his curse from this place. It was before he went... Yeah, okay. Um, where's my building worlds? Canaculus guide. I need the timeline from here. Ten... It was as he came back home right before the God War that the curse was lifted. So, knowing that is helpful because we can say in the year leading up to the God War, um, which was the year 3000, 949 EE, which we can say was 751 years ago. Uh, the curse that Roid the Pacriel and lingered on the land was lifted by Arcyon after his journey of uh, after he he had journeyed and grown into a better man. So Arcyon went on this whole quest, went on this whole journey, and uh, learned that he was an asshole and that you can't go around destroying cities and killing everybody just because of petty personal reasons. In fact, you can't, you probably shouldn't do that anyway. And so he learned his lesson, he went on a big journey, and then he came back the, uh, at the end of it to Epacrio and cleansed the land of his curse. But at this time, his brother, Eranor, had risen into power and become a sort of like a, a obsessed with order and law dictator, had created the Edifitra and sent them out. And Arcyon was looking at all that and going, that's not great. So he went to confront his brother. Um, and then the God War occurred. So, uh, This meant that at last life could return to the area and people could rebuild. Now they would not do so for a while. The God War threw everything to tatters and nobody wants to start something new in the desert ruins of a place where no life grows, but over time, over many, many years, things did grow back. And eventually somebody had the idea 
to to go and to build a city there. And it's relatively recently that they decided to do that. God of War music is intense. I'm going to swap it out. For something far less intense. Shadow of the Colossus. <laughs> um, I'm just checking on a few little... Little butts. Little butts and pusses. <laughs> Checking out a few little bits and pieces. Cool beans. That having been decided, uh, the person who decided to rebuild, when did they decide to rebuild is the question. Was it when everybody started to... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's when everything began to reconnect is when it happened. So let's have a quick peek at that timeline again. The history. Age of Scars. Yeah, I'm not actually, I don't care about that. I'm interested in so what is known in the galaxy is the Age of Reconnection, uh, or the post-war era, last 700 years. The Tahiri system is rediscovered, and then 10 years later in the year 570 post-war, so 130 years ago, in response to Tahiri aggression, the Anaran Assembly is formed. Fantastic. And I think uh, year 560, around that time, let's say 565, let's say 565, um, new age of reunification, 565, E.W. Amthrel Old begins reconstruction of the city of Epak. Yeah. The city begins to be reconstructed 135 years in the past. Amthrel Toll begins that work. I scrolled right past it, didn't I? Yes, I did. Um... Five sixty-five EW five years after the rediscovery of the Tahiri system and its now warmongering empire of humans. A human by the name of Amthrel Toll began reconstruction of the holy city of Epacriel with funding from the Green Crusade slash the Tahiri. Empire. So religious influences begin the process of rebuilding an entire city, which is no small feat. No small feat at all. 135 years ago. Making a little timeline of the city. And now, present day. Seven hundred post war. Epacriel is once 
more becoming a central hub of trade in the galaxy. A city funded by Esmeran worshipping Nikiri citizens and populated originally mostly by zealous humans Epacreal has since become the multicultural hub of the past, but retains a sympathy for the Tahiri cause and a distrust slash hatred of the Anaran Assembly. Um, it's here basically that the Dahiri Empire, the, the, the humans who worship the Esmeran gods, are able to reach out and say, look, we are happy to live alongside non-human races. That's what the city always has been about. That's what the Esmerans made it to be. Um, so, um, the city is the Tahiri Empire's way of saying that they are happy to live alongside other races. In fact, that was what the Esmeran Empire was all about eh, for much of its history, anyways. Mm. If that darned Anaran assembly would just give them the bodies of their gods, there wouldn't be any need for the current conflict. So they say. So that's kind of the idea for Ipacrio. Ipacrio is a big deal. It's a big city, and it's, uh, there's a lot of people involved. Let's talk a little bit about Amthrel Toll, who is known as the Exalt of Ipacrio. Um, Amthrel Toll. Human. But obviously, something else is at play because he was the founder of the city and is still alive and looking to be look, looking like he is middle aged. So he's got some kind of immortality, this guy. Political and personal reason for conflicts. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Um, yeah, like, like everybody's got a propaganda ca campaign, you know? Like the Tahiri Empire's propaganda campaign is, listen, they were our gods. They were the gods of humanity. And we want their bodies. We want to be able to... Uh, bring them home to respect them, a, you know, and give them, you know, all proper rights and that they should rest in the religious centers that worship them the most. And 
that really it's all a big, a big misunderstanding, and the Anaran Assembly are jealously guarding the bodies of these gods, and and are probably doing depraved and horrible things to them. Yeah, it's it's a propaganda machine. They are a warmongering empire that wants to control all of the territory of the uh, of the empire, really. Although the uh, the Green Crusade or the Green Legion, what do they call them anyway? Factions. Yeah, the Green Crusade. The Green Crusade are definitely uh, wanting those bodies, for sure. So, uh, the Exalt Anthrel Toll. A uh, human, um, he has some way of making himself immortal. Anthrel Toll, um, known as a fact man with uh, an extraordinary intellect. He does not, despite his affiliations with them, Consider himself a member of the Dahiri Empire. Why do I keep doing the instead of the? The uh, Dahiri Empire. Instead, he used them and their funding as the means to rebuild the city. For him. Uh, he is a capitalist through and through and has been very quick to establish a prosperous spaceport and centers of trade in Ipacreal. Providing incentives to businesses and corporations to operate through his city. Do you see it as a oh, we would like to do right by their bodies and such, when the reality is they want them to pursue advancement. It It's not clear why they want the bodies. Um, their propaganda is, yes, we would like to do right by their bodies, and they are, you know, the, and they are our gods, so they should rest with the worshippers of, of those gods. Uh, so that's definitely, like, yeah, that's definitely the front that they are, uh, are that they are portraying. They could do insane stuff with those bodies. The, the those bodies housed some of the most powerful uh, energies, uh, like those gods wielded some of the, the the greatest powers ever in the universe. And so there is a real fear amongst the Inarn Assembly that if they were to get their hands on the bodies of all these gods, they would they would be unstoppable. They would somehow figure out how to tap into that power, somehow be able to um, create new gods out of their bodies or something. Yeah, so there's definitely that fear. Whether or not um, that is something that is possible, we don't know. Whether that is something that, um, that, that they would do, but we know that... As with like all advancement, um, ooh, was that as, as easy as that the entire time? Maybe I can move this in a little bit. Ooh. Yeah, it's a little better. Um, sorry, I was just playing. I was just playing with my display there for a second on OBS. Um, yeah. Uh, whether that's possible, we know that we know that power-hungry people will always people will always try stuff, right? There will always be factions who are uh, looking to advance power, and those people have the political weight 
and leverage to make things happen. So yeah, if they if they wanted to, they would be able to do some experiments. Anyway, we don't know if they would be, if they would be successful, but the fear that they could is enough that the assembly's like, yeah, we can't let that happen, ma'am. We can't let that happen. Um, very much how like the the southern states gaslighted everybody in the states post Civil War, being like, we weren't fighting for. That's really loud. Let's turn that down a little bit. We weren't fighting for uh, racist reasons. We weren't fighting for slavery, even though that was the explicit message of um, the Confederates: is that we were they're fighting because they believe the black people are worth less than human than human than than white human people. Um, and then went, no, it was about states' rights. It definitely wasn't about being racist or wanting slaves. Um, it was about states' rights, and and that's kind of the situation here. Is there it's that that gaslighting of, oh, it definitely wasn't our stated intention, which is that we are going to reclaim all of the territory of the Ismeran Empire and reestablish a human-dominated society. Um, no, it's definitely that we were trying to get the bodies of our gods, and and if you just give those to us, there wouldn't be any need for a conflict. So that's. It's, a, it's propaganda. The Dahiri Empire is run by bad people who want to do bad things. And they're trying to convince everybody that they're reasonable. Basically. And you know, it's been a few leaders later. Maybe, maybe the new leaders are nice. Maybe the new leaders are good. This smile means that they're, they're not. <laughs> So, we have the Freelands, Ipacriel, Iorva, Shekranagol, the provinces. Let's talk about Ed Helen, shall we? Who, Ed Helen, a nation of elves who were, again, uh, stranded on uh because this was a call this would have been like a colony um colony earned nation of elves who were stranded on unan uh when the god war broke communication between the worlds uh, moreover, what uh, occurred here is that um, the elves of Ed Helen received word that Melamara um, had joined the conflict. And had been subsequently uh, burned to, or that the, um, and that the forests had been subsequently burned to nothing um, as collateral damage between dragons and gods. Uh, so, believing that Melamara was destroyed and that their home was destroyed, um, the elves here needed to establish sovereignty, and they needed to establish borders, and they needed to establish protection of their forests. These forests will not be uh, tainted by anybody. You won't do it. And so, let's talk, actually, let's talk about Talaris, and let's see if we can get some coloring done. Yay! 
Yeah, let's get green. Let's just get a straight green. Ooh, baby. There it is. Those are the forests of Ed Helen. That's a little bit too much. So we're going to undo what we did there. So far, so good. I like the greenery. There. Ed Helen has forests which expand. You know, I've expanded quite a lot, actually. Um, I've expanded... Sort of along the southern tip of the continent of Talaris. The green texture is so pretty. I love it so much. When I figure out borders, I'm definitely never doing like the tree icons. Like I want to use just this texture, right? Um, no, it's gorgeous. Green piece. <laughs> <Elves>. <laughs> Yeah, sure. <laughs> oh lord. Yeah, all right. Um, the other the other texture that we can <laughs> not texture. Uh, not that one. We there was a sort of deserty texture. We can use. Let's make the size much smaller. Around Yorva. Oh yeah, I love that sort of. That sort of desert a vibe to this kind of area around here that definitely sort of like extends north to this yeah the idea very much this kind of area is Is desert along this side of the continent. Maybe not. Maybe it's not necessary to extend it that much. That far down. Yeah, maybe that's. Yeah, maybe that's enough. Maybe that's enough. Is this the normal texture? Yeah, they just kind of play with the edges of where that. Where that actually is. Yeah. Your va. Let's make it cleaner lines. I'm just messing around now. Just having fun. I do think. Yeah. Cool. We'll play around with that. Uh, where we have played around with that. Hit screen. And of course, don't forget Yogar! On the coast there. Ha! Ha 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 ha! Because that's the same continent of Ion Voss. I like the textures that start to come with this. It's, it's good. It's good stuff. Um... Cool, we were talking about Ed Helen. Were we not? There wasn't really a red texture, was there? We, we looked last time, I seem to recall. It was brown, dark brown, orange? Does orange look okay? It doesn't hurt. Looks fine. Niagara Chagall. It's not, a, it's not a huge difference, but it is a slight one, and I'll take it. I will take the slight difference. So let's talk about Ed Helen. Now. Um, it is a an open secret of sorts. That, yeah, it's an open, let's call it an open secret. Um, it is an open secret that uh, the elves established their colony not only for elven kind, but also for 
their ancestor trees whom they call the first race first living things that existed um when you have trees that stand taller even than the spires of Epacriel, it can be difficult to hide. That said, the magics that protect the trees and the forest are strong indeed, even against starships slash attacks from the sky. Attacks from the sky. Ha! Ah, I say. Uh, so though that is Ed Helen. Uh, they are led by what's going to be called the Queen Regent, but it is now just the Queen, Kira. And did we come up with Queen Regent? Now, simply Queen Kira. And I'm certain that we need a surname. So let's go looking for um, Elvish surname. Elvish surnames. 150 hand-picked surnames. So let's just smash a couple of these together to get, a, to get an original one. Um, those aren't surnames. Last names... Kill a Brimbor is not a surname, I don't think. Um, a lot of these are just from D&D. &D. These are first names. What a stupid website. I'm calling them out. Uh, elf names, fantasy name generator. Let's just go over here. Hey, neutral names. That is fine. Maghana. I kind of like Maghana. Um... Feralai. Farag. Faraghana. Kira Faraghana. Ooh, what a great name. It takes so many syllables. Faraghana. Queen Kira Faraghana. Great. Nice to get a G sound into, um... Queen Regent's name at some point. Oh yeah, we definitely do need to uh, we need to create a leader for the Red Isles, the new the the orcs who live there now as well. Yeah, there's a nice mud red texture and par parchment textures if you like on incarnate. Let's have a look. Open catalog. Parchment textures. Um, the rest of these, except for parchment one, parchment green two, are pro. Parchment ocean one. Oh no, there it is. You're absolutely right. Parchment, no, Parchment Dark Brown. That's not what we're talking about. Parchment Ocean 3. Uh, I don't know which one you're talking about. Nice mud red texture. In Parchment Textures. I mean, I would love that, but... I think it's only for pro, I'm afraid. I'm going to have to get pro, and then we'll come back to this next week. That's a solid idea. 
Solid idea. I will have a real play around with these. Ice and snow textures are so pretty. Oh my gosh. And the wasteland textures are glorious. Glorious. Um, let's get, let, you know what, let's get an elf. Uh, sorry, not an elf. Uh, an orcish. Orc. Orc name generator. Orc names. Orc names Elder Scrolls. Let's, let's go for that because it's a little, little different here. And we definitely want a woman to be leading uh, the Red Isles because that, that feels cool. It feels really cool. Um, female female names <laughs> Borgok <laughs> I like the idea of, of an orc woman named Borgok who leads a country but I'm, I think I'm going to go with Ugaza because that's a great name uh, Ugaza let's get a surname in here Ugaza Uzukuz, Uzu, Uzukug, Uzugub. Uh, Ugaza, Uzu. Hmm. Orgaza, Orgaku, Orgaku. Orgaku. I like Orgaku. Let's do that. Um, characters. And do 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 Ugaza. Ugak. I believe that's what it said on the thing. Urgaku. Ugaza Urgaku. Um, female orcish leader of the Red Isles, a recovering nation. Queen Regent, so what kind of a person do we think Hira Karagana is? What kind of person is it who, who realizes that her home has been destroyed and then takes charge and just establishes hard borders and it's like only people who are super dedicated to nature and trees are allowed in here and establishes in a nation that spans a, a good chunk of a continent protects this place i think that this person is uh fierce in the protection of her people and the forests Um, is she a family person? Probably she's a family person because it becomes important to propagate the species. So, um, yeah, let's say that she, like, you know, elf babies are, are rare, but she has three children. Two girls and a boy. She is married to. She married to. Let's come up with a. Let's come up with a. Elven name. Uh, for a guy that she might be married to. Oh, I just saw a Alu Aluin. I just like the the name Aluin. Aluin, something or other. Halloween. Vatris. Let's just keep it simple. Um, Halloween Vatris. Yeah, basically, basically, don't fuck with this uh, with this person in their forests, and you'll be fine. Um, I think for now that's enough detail. We still have around half an hour. Let's see if we can, let's we we've added a great amount of detail to all of this, and I I, I think that's really really cool. We have added quite a bit of detail to all the established facts that we put out last time at the beginning. 
I think... The thing to do... Next... You know what? I've decided I don't like the way the desert doesn't quite reach the edges there. I'm gonna, gonna fix it now. Is this the, that's the right one? Yeah, it's the right one. We're just gonna get right in there. We're just gonna fill in the rest. I'm gonna say that the area around there, around Yorva, and the northern part of Ion Voss is not necessarily entirely desert, but that kind of like hot, cracked earth. Um, you can irrigate it if you've got enough water kind of thing. And uh, that reaches over to Aogar over there. Yeah. Let's just make it a little bit, a little bit more uniform. Um, I think the Freelands... Oh, textures have we got. What textures have we got for free? What can we do, huh? What are we gonna do? Parchment Ocean? What are we gonna do with that? Do we care about that? Do we even... Do we even care? I ask you. I ask you if we even care. Land textures. Land Grey. We don't want Land Grey. I have fallen into something. <laughs> Um, I'm falling into something. I don't have many greens to choose from, but a grass mixed would be kind of interesting. I have too much from the textures now, and I'm just kind of like, can we do something fun for the for the freelands to delineate? Oh yes, 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 yes. This kind of perfectly gives the. The impression that I I want to to give about freelance. Oh, beautiful! Oh, we love to see it. We absolutely love to see it. Uh, we will stop with the textures thing, but the freelance. Oh, mm, mwah. glorious, beautiful texture. Thank you so much for for having it. Let's. Can we give? Let's throw some more names out at, for, for for later elaboration, shall we? Because we've 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 done we've done quite a bit of fleshing out of this area, and I think that's very, very cool. Um Yeah. Let's let's throw a couple more names out for funsies. For funsies. So there are a couple, we're gonna say there are a couple of nations. Boop, we're gonna say that's one. And we're gonna no, we're gonna rotate that so that it's level. Oh, I see what's happening here. Zero. Nice. Um the Hossa. Definitely won't don't want to call it the Hossa. Uh let's See, let's think of some, let's think of some creative uh, nations. Let's like, let's think of nations. You know what I'm saying? You know, you know what I'm saying here? Um, something like. Like, uh. Like Dazaroth. You know? Yeah, yeah. The nation of Dazaroth. What you gonna do? What you gonna do when Dazaroth comes around? Duh? What you what you gonna how you gonna feel about Dazaroth? Uh what's going on with Dazaroth? Um let's let's say that there are like you know, there are there are a few little nations over here, so let's make a boom and a boom and a boom. You know what I'm saying? And let's say the, instead of there's there's Dazaroth, um, and like this one's gonna be on the coast, and there was a lot of like coastal raiding from Shekranagol at a certain point. 
Uh, so they don't, like they have beef with the Red Isles. Um, let's call this Jail. Is that too much like Jail if it's spelled like that? How about L E Jail? Yeah. It's the Kingdom of Jail. Uh, plunk. That's another one. Uh, neighboring kingdom to jail. Uh, what are we, what are we, what are we gonna call this? Mm. B O. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> Botunga, welcome to Botunga. Nation of Botunga, little nation. Um, slightly larger nation now. Mm. Yeah, let's it's the land of something. Let's make a land. Um Yeah, let's make a land of Gralayan. Is that something? Gralala Gralaland? Graland. Yes, Graland. Gra Graland. Graland. Dazaroth. Um. And one more. Come on, let's do let's do one more. Uh Hell? Is that enough? Kelm, Kelm, Kelv, Kelk, Kelt, <laughs> Kelg, Kel, Keld. Let's remind you of the gathering. Kelj. Impossible. The music is kind of intense. Let's see. I don't know if I'm a fan of that. Um, let's get some, some peaceful music too. Absolutely don't need to listen to advertisements while I switch over the soundtrack. Do some Witcher. Let's. Cal. Cool. So we now we have some. Um, yeah, let's just say it's called Kel. It's the nation of Kel. Big nation to the north is Dazaroth. Big nation to the south. And then the smaller nations of Zael and Batunga. So we've got uh we've got a few nations there. Let's give this island that it, uh you can't see where I'm pointing. Let's give this island a little bit of independence. Let's give that island a name. Um
Hmm. Is donation far enough away? Yeah, I mean, it could be Ur Eogar or. Or it could be like a yeah 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 like a like a like a new Aogar uh, that gets so should we call it like Novagar? <laughs> that sounds fun. Nova Gar. Yeah, so that's its own island. Little island. Screen. And then we gotta we gotta go over here, I think. We're populating the nearby areas because those are the ones we care about the most at the moment. Novagar. And I think this is a north and south of a particular kind of nation thing, like a north and south Korea or a north and south Vietnam kind of deal. Um I do, I do think that that's probably the way that this goes. So, um, what's, uh, what's something, a, um, Vietnam or Korea. Let's get some of that, like, hard consonant sounds of Asia kind of in there. Piksha. North and South Piksha. Hmm. Shar 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 Ku Kushar Kushar Ku Wu Shar Wu Sharu. Charlene. Charlene. South Charlene. North Charlin. That's not meant to be a direct thing to it's just an inspiration for naming, basically. North Charlin and South Charlin. Okay, so we've sort of thrown out some ideas there, some some names for other populating areas we've got the provinces which sort of maybe are their own thing and then the kingdoms on the other side of the continent maybe there's stuff going on there oh you know what we can do and it's maybe the wrong idea to do this with textures however however we can start to do the scars yes indeed pardon me one so we know for a fact that there are these scars that we've been talking about. And the scar diving will become a thing. There's got to be one at least near to Yorva. Oh, I mean, that doesn't look great, does it? What happens if I reduce the softness to... Okay. What happens if I increase the size? Got to make sure to... Make it so that they can. Um, 
roughness. Oh, now we're talking. Yes, yes, yes. Lower that in size. Undo. Mm, mm, mm. Interesting. No, opacity full. Roughness three. Now we're talking. Yes. The Orvis got a scar. Not there, but nearby and massive. I don't want it to look in any way like a penis, but that's going to be difficult, isn't it? This is tricky. I want it to look like a big old scar in the ground. Thinner than that, slightly. There we go. Alberta, <laughs> this is going to be bad. I, I don't know what TTP stands for. I can look it up. In fact, I'm happy to look that up on my phone right now. Um, TTP meaning. Don't know. Um, are these scars really ugly and do they detract from the overall look of the world? You know, a little bit. They're not quite where I want it to be yet. So we can undo those two. Hmm. On lower opacity, actually, that's a little bit better. That's a little bit better. Um, let's increase it to 55 opacity. And then we see, yeah, there's a scar there. It's absolutely massive. I'm the one to put you on to Mythic Quest. This is true. And I really enjoy Mythic Quest. Um, However, I still don't remember what TTP stands for. My, it may be that my brain is just tired as it's getting near 11 and I've been uh, awake for a long period of time. Could also be that I'm just an idiot uh, and don't remember the thing. But uh, I think there's a scar in the north there. Oh, overlap is no good on the opacity thing. Let's, see, let's get the scars in order first so there's some scars there is there one running down this continent like that yes there is uh are there scars that are being fought over and helping to divide these countries absolutely there are again that opacity is going to absolutely kill me i don't like it at all Uh, another there. Yeah, sort of the scars of this world. We can begin to put other ones in place elsewhere. <laughs> then why don't you send it to me privately, uh, Alberta, and you can you can inform me there. <laughs> uh, cool. So we've begun. Uh. To put the scars on. Have check Facebook. Fantastic. Got it. Cool. I still don't remember the reference from Mythic Quest, um, but I see your message. So there is that. 
Ooh, well, I should save all of this progress that has been made on this uh, planet. We've got 10 minutes left. I think the thing to do um, will be to, instead of just adding more names to a map, let's talk about, let's talk about more factions. Um, I want to talk for a second about um, Exalt Amthrel Bowl. Um, religious enforcers. So I think they're actually, what are we going to call it, religious enforcers? Um, let's call them peacekeepers. Why not? That's, that's, you know, that's evil. Uh, religious, uh, police force that work for the exalt it's not just a Mythic Quest thing, but they explain it there. Such a clip later. Uh, I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, because for whatever reason, that had no re no hold on my memory <laughs> whatsoever. And probably if a character says it, I'll be like, oh yes, I remember that scene. But uh, right now, in the middle of whatever I'm doing, can't think. Absolutely can't think. Religious police force that work for the exalt and act as a secret police slash spy network for him as well. Mm. While many factions hold uh, some military presence within the city walls, in secret. All are answerable to the exalt and to his peacekeepers. So that's just the way that he stays in power. So that's something about him. Uh... Hmm. Let's do, like, a faction of do-gooders. Let's have somebody really nice. Is there a faction of heroes? Yeah. Let's say that there's a, there's a group of, there's just a group of heroes, like an adventuring party that would have their own campaign. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... <laughs> Immediately, the thought that came to my head to do as the joke would be Ion Voss Machina. Uh, <laughs> I'm tempted to do it, to be fair. I'm interested to know, anybody who's watching, will you throw in the chat whether that's a good idea or not to have a, a, a heroic group on this world called Ion Voss Machina? Um... <laughs> Cause it's 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 cheeky, but it's fun cheeky. I've got the go ahead from Alberta, so I you know unless somebody throws in something in the chat, I think I'm gonna do it. Cause it's it's fun. Ion Voss Machina, a uh, group of heroes, an adventuring party who have. Done a great deal of good in the area. There, those. It's. I think it's important to keep those happening. Like, it's not as though we can do a campaign on every group of do-gooders, or at least like adventuring party, chaotic wild people out there. And if they, if those people exist, then there's a chance to meet them, and then either they turn out to be assholes or they're in competition with the group or they provide some, some kind of reflection on the group's actions in some way but yeah the uh, ion Voss machina they exist there and maybe maybe a party someday will meet them but maybe they won't um they're, but they're out there and the you know the the papers 
uh, the town criers can talk about the, the heroics of Ion Vos Machina. That's kind of fun. And the last thing I wanted to just touch on is that uh, this is, uh, Gate Tech, this is the corporation that makes and sells um, the gate uh, technology uh, component for spaceships that allows them to travel between solar systems. Um, do they have a monopoly? Um, because they have a practical monopoly brackets while there are other companies that have made gates gate tech technology and sold them before whenever Whenever they grow to be a competitor, Gate Tech always buys them out or something tragic accidentally. Let's do a little brackets around that accidentally. Uh, that's something, something, something tragic. Um, and unfortunate happens to make the company go go under uh so gay tech is like a big evil corporation who want to maintain a, a monopoly on space travel something that everybody needs so that's yeah, corporations are bad in this universe they are bad and there are a few that are particularly bad uh pack me corp um, transport and sell, uh, exotic animals from various, well, let's say animals and plants from various worlds. And, uh, may or may not be involved in the trafficking of humanoids for the black market, which does exist on this world, it's the black market. Gets uh, a lot of business from Pacme Corp. There you go. Alrighty. Well, I think that's it for me for tonight. I'm getting a little tired. We've got a lot of detail now on this world. I don't know whether to come back to Unan next week as well. Because there's so much of it left to look at or whether this is a first go over and that's okay and we should just keep moving through other worlds and and come back to this afresh some other time hmm what do we think what do we think i i think We'll leave Unan. Save changes again. Just make sure that we've got that down. We'll leave Unan for now. For now. Um, mm, 
No. We're going to come back one more week. We're going to come back one more week to Unan. And we are going to blitz name creation. We're going to blitz uh, just putting things on the map that we will explore later. We're going to blitz mountains and terrains and various ideas for landscapes and nations and ideologies that could be represented on all of these different continents. We're, we're going to blitz it. And it's going to be a lot of detail that's not going to be filled in. It's going to be a bit surface level. But by the end, we will have a working world map of Unan. And that's important. So we're going to do it. And then the week after, maybe we'll do one week on Matazion. Because most of the work's been done on Matazion. But... It will allow for a map to be made of that world, which is important, and a few details to be given to you guys and to be filled in. Because so we only need one week on it, is what I'm saying. So we're coming back to Unan. We're gonna have a we're gonna have a working world map for this. Uh, yeah, for this world that feels good to me. That feels strong and solid. Okay, thank you all very much for watching and joining in and chatting, uh, listening to me ramble on and on and on and on and on and on. Um, this has been Building Worlds, uh, Unan session number two. There will be a session number three uh, next week right here at 7.30 GMT. If you are looking for previous episodes, you can find them either on Twitch for two weeks after they go up or on the Hidden Realms YouTube channel. Uh, so, yeah, uh, go and check those out for their, uh, where they will live uh, in, in longevity. Thank you so much again. Um, and I'll see you later. Goodbye. Goodbye. See you Thursday, Kerry. Goodbye. 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 Goodbye.